A loaded episode right here of Gators Breakdown. We're going to get caught up on spring practice. Hear from Billy Napier, Austin Armstrong, and Jason Marshall, including the latest on injuries of Miles Graham and Cam Waits that will keep them out for the rest of spring. We're going to have some insider practice notes from Friday or Thursday, Saturday's uh, spring practices, so a lot to get into there. Brought to you by Florida Victorious and the message board that you just won't find anywhere else. Also, we'll get into the curious commitment of safety Keon Young to the Gators, but was later found out not to be accepted by Florida. And finally, the SEC dropping the ball on the 2025 schedule. A loaded episode here is Gators Breakdown. Let's get into it. Gators Breakdown. Because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. Oh, never a dull moment for sure. I mean, a lot, a lot to talk to, a lot, a lot to talk about. As I just went over right here from this episode of Gators Breakdown, so hit that like button, subscribe to Gators Breakdown if you haven't done so yet, right here on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. Uh, before we get started, thanks to everybody who reached out to me the last couple of days. Had a little minor medical scare Friday night. Had to stay overnight in the hospital. Uh, nothing too major, but thanks to everybody who saw it on Twitter or Gators Breakdown Plus uh, message board or Discord there. Uh, thanks everybody for uh, keeping the positive spirits going and all that there. But uh, I'm all good, all, all all good. I'm going to sh- maybe struggle this episode a little bit. Uh, the throat's kind of weak right now. Uh, but hey, look, as I said, there's so much going on. Can't go without giving you an episode of Gators Breakdown here. I'm going to try and power through it. Uh, so there might be some weird pauses, awkward silences, or whatever. Just bear with me uh, going through a little bit of stuff right now. But I'll be back 100 percent very soon. All right, leave your comments, support uh, Gators Breakdown right there, leaving comments, hitting that like button, subscribing. Uh, Stay tuned. Later this week on Gators Breakdown, we will have wide receiver Trey Wilson right here on the podcast. Watch it on the video version of YouTube as well. Going to get the playmaker himself right here on Gators Breakdown. Lots to get into with him later on this week. Also, of course, Gators Breakdown Plus. Keep that conversation going. Right there on the Discord, you get the ad-free episodes, extra episodes. Um, newsletter, Q&A, all that good stuff right there. Gators Breakdown Plus link is in the description to join. So, all right, let's get into it. Uh, everything that is to go on in spring practice right now. And just look, there's a, there's a lot to get into, <laughs> as you heard me say at the beginning right here. So uh, let's get caught up with the recent news and updates out of spring practice. Billy Napier opened up his Saturday press conference with an optimistic outlook on where things stand five practices in. Uh, says, quote, I think one of the things that has become very evident is new staff members are making an impact. I got a ton of conviction about the new people that we've added to our team. I tell you, it's uh, I tell you, it's giving me a little bit of energy. I can't compliment enough the group as a whole of Ron Roberts, Will Harris, Gerald Chapman, Joe Houston, John DeCoster, Jake Sankel. Obviously, Tyler Miles was with us last year in a different role. New staff members are making an impact. And I think the other thing I would say is we come off of spring break and Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and we finish strong today. Uh, I thought we knocked the rust off on Tuesday. Defense probably got the best of the offense on Thursday, and the offense probably won today, which means on Saturday. It was competitive. There's intensity, a little different level of focus with this group. There's a healthy respect between the offense and the defense, and I think we're making progress there. We're building culture. I think we can compete and still come back together and be a team. For the first time, you've got experience. You've got some young talent. There's depth, so there's more competition. Overall, I would say the new staff members are making an impact, and I think the practice has been intense, focused, competitive. We're getting better because of that. I think we've got to continue to learn how to practice, but overall, it's been a good week. It's good to finish the right way. So there we go. A little bit of positive outlook there from Billy Napier about all the competition this spring, new faces on the staff. Uh, got some energy in him, he says, with this new staff. So that's, that's good to hear. Uh, but, of course, you know, all these are just words. I know it's press conference season. It's talking season. We don't get to see a whole lot uh, from these practices. I will have some insider practice notes from Florida Victorious uh, coming at you in just a few minutes. But let's hear more. From Billy Napier on the milestones he's hoping to hit at this point in the spring, or if he's looking for milestones, uh, and position groups that have stood out so far. Yeah, I don't necessarily know that we've got quotas that we're trying to hit or anything like that. I mean, we evaluate every single rep of every single day, right? And then we take the entire practice and then we kind of build our plan for improvement for the next day. 
You know, I think um, I, I would just say I'm evaluating Florida, you know, based off, and, and obviously it's completely different than Louisiana to some degree in terms of the evolution of our team. But um, experience matters, you know, and I think we had 20,000 snaps of experience, I think year one and year two. And we're working with a group that's got 41,000 snaps of experience, right? So it's a veteran team. Uh, there's a different level of leadership, accountability, the character dynamic. Um, just look forward to coming to work. And I think the, the new staff has created some energy uh, and they're making an impact. The combination of those two things uh, has me excited. You know, I think we, uh, I believe in our team, I do. I uh, I walked off the field today. I think we got a chance to have a good football team. Position group. Right yeah. Um, I know you don't like secondary. Football. I think I think yeah. that the secondary um, obviously got some. Gates is coming back from injury. Um, you've got those young players that have experience. Devin, uh, Sharif Denson, Jordan Castell, Bryce Thornton, all those freshmen that played. Right, are back. Uh, then you throw Jason Marshall in the mix, and then you add a couple of these portal safeties. Um, you know, I think that that group is making progress. I like the, uh, yeah, the offensive line. You know, I think that the height, length on the edges, the moves we took, Damian, move him in the guard. Jake got significant experience. Uh, we just got more depth than we've had. I think that's the. Uh, and therefore, we have competition. And therefore, practice is more competitive. And we can make adjustments. You know, you're either above the line or below the line each day. And hey, your reps are being adjusted. And this competition, I think, makes everybody better, right? So, um, you know, there are positions that need to improve, but I don't know that that's for public. I mean, we're, we're always, at this point in the process, the team has to continue to improve each individual, each position group, the units. Um, but we're just a we're more experienced team. Of course, definitely sounds like Billy Napier likes where his team is at in the early stages of fall camp. And look, he even mentioned, I mean, there there's more experience on this team. Youth is not going to be the excuse it was last year. And look, as I said, we'll have some insider notes that can go along with some of what Billy Napier had to say. But it is nice to hear from his side. Uh, where he likes this team so far, but it wasn't all n positive news coming out of Saturday. And that's a couple of injuries at a couple of position groups that really need to be healthy. Nothing major, but you know, here's Napier on the injuries of linebacker Miles Graham and offensive lineman Cam Woods. Yeah, probably two significant ones would be Miles Graham. You know, he had a injury coming in, right? We went through phase one and phase two. We kind of set a deadline like hey when we get to spring break if we feel like hey this is going to be a long-term issue we want to go ahead and get it fixed uh, so we did we made that decision um, and we anticipate getting him back for the fall camp cam waits uh, had a strained calf and uh, soft tissue injury nothing major there but he'll be out for for a bit so um, those are the main two We've got some other soft tissue things, um, but overall, those are the main two. All right, so, of course, you know, with Shamar James and Derek Wingo at the linebacker spot already being limited this spring, it was going to be, uh, going back to what we talked about coming into spring practice, we knew those guys were going to be limited, so this was going to be a nice time for early enrollee Miles Graham to get acclimated to the college game, get reps with other young linebackers, Pup Howard, Jaden Robinson, and then the veteran Manny Nunnery as well, so... Uh, th there is value in these guys getting reps with you know the injury taking place, but Graham needed them too. Uh, so you know, back injuries are tricky. This doesn't sound too serious. So hopefully he's back fully ready to go in the fall. And look, let's go back. I mean, Florida's had, Florida's had two standout freshmen the last couple of years in Shamar James and Jordan Castell on the defensive side of the ball, making high impacts as freshmen. Uh, but both those guys were early enrollees and, and taking part in spring practice. And, and Graham, you know, has at least been in the new strength and conditioning program, a couple of spring practices. Uh, but now, you know, he'll join Aaron Childs uh, in, in the fall as freshman linebackers needing to put it together pretty fast to, to have a big impact next season. I and mean, I'm not necessarily sure a large impact is needed 
from that for, from those two guys. And I say needed. Uh, it certainly can help elevate this group. But I don't think it's needed uh, from these two guys, but certainly I think contributions are needed. And uh, to, as long as you have that to go along with other guys making plays at a high level. Uh, so, look, hopefully those guys can come in and make a huge impact. I just don't think it's needed as long as Pup Howard, Manny Nunnery, um, Shamar James comes back, Derek Wingo. I mean, those guys come back fully healthy, ready to go. And you got Pup Howard, Manny Nunnery. I, I think what you get out of Miles Graham and Aaron Childs can be plus. And I hope it, I hope it's big pluses. I mean, it, you hope it is. But now injuries come into play. Uh, late additions to the defense that you know will now would mostly be getting their reps in the fall. Uh, so we'll see their timeline and if they can put it together pretty fast. Napier did say in regards to this, I think in partic- particular, in particular, you take a guy like Manny Nunnery who's coming back year two in the system. I was eating dinner with Manny just the other day and just talked about how he's so much more comfortable just living life. He knows the routine, knows where everything's at, comfortable with the defensive system. He showed up. He's having a good spring camp. Pup Howard, obviously, has continued to get reps. and looks like he's got a promising future. Napier went on to say on Nunnery that he brings a ton of experience and is a size speed player. Pairing that with new voice, the experienced voice of Ron Roberts is a huge plus to go along with the continuity of Austin Armstrong. Quote, Manny's a good example of the entire team. I go back to, we've got a lot of guys who have experience that came back. This team is a hungry group. You know they've got something to prove. I think it has a great mix of veteran leadership and young talent. There's something about this group. It's a fun group to coach, and I think the practice environment has reflected that. More on that group in a bit in, in, in these notes, but I mean, Billy Napier, once again, just kind of hammering home the notion of this is an experienced group. We do have young talent. You know, we, we've seen this young talent play out the last couple of years and in some high-level play. You know, Trevor Etienne is a true freshman at the running back spot. Um, Jordan Castell last year is a true freshman. Shamar James, let's go through those two get, two names again. Trey Wilson last year. Marshall Johnson come as a sophomore uh, from, from Louisiana, stepping up his play in the SEC. I mean, we've seen the young talent, and we're excited. We'll get into Kelby Collins and TJ Searcy coming up in a bit as well and their impacts, what they did last year, and how that can contribute to this coming up year. But, look, there have been – some nice key young spots we've seen. So you hope you compare all those guys, besides ETN, of course, um, the experience that they've gained over the last few years, couple years, to be the players we think they can be. And you hope you get that same type of play out of your true freshman group again. So really Napier does seem to think that that's, you know, there's a lot of competition out there that's going to make this team better. I do think this team will be, be- will be better because of that. Of course, schedule comes into play and we'll see how much of that affects this team. I do think there is still a lot to like about this team compared to years past. All right, so let's go to the offensive line. Austin Barber, of course, was already out this spring at tackle. Uh, Now Cam Waits looks likely to be missing the rest of spring, is how Billy Napier put it. Uh, So we'll we'll see. Maybe something happens. He's back out there. But, I mean, missing the rest of spring as well for a spot that needs continuity and competition. Thankfully, Florida went and acquired Brendan Crenshaw-Dixon and Devin Manuel. Or this would be a disaster uh, along the offensive tackle spots right now. It'd be a scary, much scarier situation. You know, this does allow Caden Jones, Bryce Lovett, true freshman Fletcher Westfall to gain reps here this spring. Uh, but I'd love to see Wait to look. He dealt with an injury last year. He missed spring last year, recovering from that uh, Achilles injury. So you know, it would be nice to, for him to get a chance to go through spring practice with consistency, continuity, competition uh, for the tackle spots. So that's the uh, not to be, uh, so a hit there at the tackle spot where we dove into it heavy last week with Rob Sale and hearing from him uh, about the competition that they have uh, at those spots now. It takes a little bit of a hit with, of course, Barber being out, but you were able to, you know, he had the experience. You were hoping Waits would get the reps here to go along with Dixon and Manuel. So, you know, it takes a little bit of a hit as far as all, all, all those things go, uh, but certainly doesn't seem like too serious where Cam Waits will not, you know, be able to take part in fall ball. So take it kind of safe this spring, getting back in the fall. So, all right, let's continue our spring practice coverage with some notes, insider practice notes from Florida Victorious. And I'm not going to give it all away, uh, but give enough away so give enough away so you guys know what you're missing there. 
Um, these are imp- insider practice notes you are not going to get anywhere else. I'm going to share a few uh, right here, but let's start on it. This is from Gaines Vegas, um, and he has generously given his insider practice notes to the Florida Victorious Message Board. And he goes, I was there Thursday and Saturday. Um, have a couple of things in here from Thursday, but Saturday was a better practice. Kind of heard Billy Napier say that as well. Here we go. This was definitely Graham Mertz's best practice. He was sharp all the way through, was hitting some deep passes today, and I would say more than he had been. He's got a couple new receivers to throw to, so there is that. And things are starting to click in the passing game. And Billy Napier mentioned it. He was asked about the explosion in the passing game at his press conference as well and saying, look, we did give Graham Mertz a cleaner pocket. He had time to throw. He's got the weapons. Team Ray DK was mentioned uh, by Billy Napier. He was also mentioned uh, here in these insider practice notes as well. This was Chim Ray DK's coming out party at practice. He's not the fastest receiver, but much like Montreal, he plays the game fast. Twice on Saturday, made a move at the end of a route to get wide open and catch a medium and long-range pass. He and Mertz are starting to click. Aiden Mizell continues to make big plays in practice. He was catching bombs for Mertz and Lagway today and on Thursday. So it does seem like the passing game early on, and I, look, I know it's spring practice. We get positive notes a, a, a whole lot. <laughs> but this is just coming from the, what is being seen so far. Does seem like the passing game starting to open up just a bit right here early on uh, in spring ball. Uh, near the note, DJ Lagway, exceptional running the bootleg near the goal line. Maybe right there. Um, something he can replicate. Sometime this fall in a special package or something. There's some nice notes on the running game I won't necessarily give away uh, from, from how that's working out with the freshman in Montreal Johnson. Uh, some offensive line notes as well to, to, to get there. Um, some notes about a couple players up front that on, on the defensive side of the ball uh, that you will really like to hear. Let's continue with some of the messaging that we got here in this episode. Manny Nunnery showed off his physical prowess on Thursday with a tough interception. He is going to play a lot this year, whether everyone is healthy or not. Pup Howard can really move for a guy that plays big at his position. He is another that will play a lot, even though it's hard to get too much as they're not in full tackle mode yet. Uh, And the notes continue on with some notes about the safeties and the star position. So you guys can take advantage. You guys can take advantage if you want more of those practice notes. He has them for every inside, every spring practice so far. Gaines Vegas is posting notes on the Florida Victorious message boards. I just gave you a taste of them. But before we move forward, of course, let's go through it. A big announcement from the University of Florida and Florida Victorious. As many of you already know, the Orange and Blue game is on April 13th, brought to you by Florida Victorious. And part of that now is an exclusive Florida Victorious member benefit. Florida Victorious will host an exclusive autograph signing for its members with head coach Billy Napier and Gator football players following the game. This is only for Florida Victorious members. All you have to do, go to the game, be a member of Florida Victorious, and you can meet and greet your favorite players, get their autographs, get some photos. Look, now it's a great time to sign up for Florida Victorious. Like $25 month level, you can also get access to the message board that includes those insider practice notes. So right now it's a no-brainer. Help support the players. You get access to players, then you get the benefits too. And look, no better time to do it than now. Use code GatorsBD. When you sign up for Florida Victorious, you get 20% off your first month to Florida Victorious. So you get some benefits out there, especially during this spring practice time. You get those insider practice notes there from Gaines Vegas. But even coming up with the spring game, you get access to Coach Billy Napier and the players after the spring game. So uh, let's continue it on right here. And Billy Napier, let's go back to that explosiveness comment. And he said, quote, I would say that's one of the things that stood out to me today. The blocking on the offensive line was cleaner. I think we've added some length on the edges. I think Devin Manuel and Brendan Crenshaw-Dixon in particular, being 6'7", 315 in that range, and having some experience as players, the pocket is cleaner. Even some of the freshmen, Caden Jones, Fletcher Westfall, were able to hold, a, hold the ball a little bit longer. I think there's no question Graham Mertz is a very capable passer, and I think he's proved over the time when the pocket is clean, he can process and distribute the ball well. We still need some work with these young receivers. We've got some development to do there. 
Chime DK has been a nice addition. He's just proven here in just a couple of days that he can make our team better. So there we go. Combining Billy Napier, what he had to say, and those insider practice notes. Hey, there you go. So maybe there is a little more something there. <laughs> so, um, But yeah, good stuff there from Gaines Vegas on the Florida Victorious board. Good stuff there from Billy Napier. You see why he feels a little bit better about this team, possibly. Um, and as far as that, what we all want to see, what's been a big point of emphasis, is the explosiveness in the passing game for this Gator offense. All right, so let's get into the defense, um, and uh, let's go. Let's start right here on what Austin Armstrong learned from his first year as an SEC defensive coordinator. "Quote: I don't think we have enough time to say what we learned." <laughs> so, being honest, there, uh, look, he expressed deep appreciation for the competitive nature of the SEC, emphasizing that the quality of the coaches and the players and the physical and schematic challenges that come with each game in this conference. Armstrong highlighted the the importance of routine and schedules uh, in both the in season and off season. And look, this is part you know for me, this is part of this part probably gets overlooked a little bit. It's not a full excuse for the issues last season, but Armstrong mentioned, "quote I think I got here ten days before spring practice started last year." In the quote, so look, a year ago, a year ago this time, we have a first time SEC defensive coordinator a very young coach and defensive coordinator overall, having to get ready to lead the defense in 10 days. Patrick Tony leaves late. Billy Napier has to make a hire, goes the, goes the up-and-coming route. Probably hard to grab a coach already cemented elsewhere, but well, you know Armstrong did come with accolades, was thought to be you know, this rising coach, still is, um, hired away from Bama as a linebacker coach at the time. Uh, many thought he was kind of the defensive coordinator in waiting eventually to take over for Kevin Still. So 10 days to get ready for spring practice a year ago and probably safe to assume that probably had some effect. Now, the defense wasn't changing a whole lot, but Armstrong had to learn the players in 10 days and make the most of spring practice. And then players had to get used to a new voice in the room and on the field. And look, it was a precursor to another failed season on that side of the ball. But now let's hear from Austin Armstrong, starting with him pinpointing what led to Florida's defensive regression in 2023 after a strong start to the season and some of the issues that plagued that side of the ball. At the end of the day, you know, we had to coach them better, and that's my responsibility, and put them in positions to be successful. Uh, you, we can sit here and we can make all these excuses about having a young team and stuff like that, and that's, that's, that's true. At the end of the day, this is a, a result-driven business, and we had an opportunity in all those games to be successful. I mean, I'm sitting there uh, thinking about, like, Arkansas. You know, they, they're showing uh, best games of the college ball season that I saw on Instagram, and they scored a touchdown with three minutes left in the fourth quarter. It was 23 to 20. We give up 13 points at that point. Missouri, 13 to 7 at halftime. Uh, even LSU, you know, obviously one of the most dynamic offenses in history college football, you know, it's 21 17. Uh, Florida State, you know, you can just name them off, and they kind of make you sick a little bit. And the ability to finish those games, and uh, at the end of the day, that's my responsibility. And it's our responsibility collectively as a staff. And I'm excited for the work that we've put in to, uh, to get that right. Yeah, what was that like personally? I mean, when you're, you go from your buddy Ryan last September and then by the end, not so much. And just your the soul searching, the, the fire it lit in you during the off season to come back and, and you know, put, put, put a better foot forward. I yeah, guess. I think, um, I don't think you can really succeed until you fail. And, you know, we're in a unique position, and God's been really good to us, and we're really fortunate. Kind of uncharted waters for a lot of people professionally. And when you're young and you're successful, you're boy wonder, and when you're not successful, you're boy blunder. <laughs> and that's just part of it. And, you know, the same people that praise you are the same people that clown you. And, you know, I'm an I'm a anti, so I don't get on social media and stuff like that. And, you know, it made me want to work harder for our players. That's what, I, what stands out to me, is that we had an opportunity to really do something significant. And we did a lot of good things last year. Uh, the thing that makes me sick is that we couldn't finish for these players. And uh, I think about it a lot. Tackling and uh, turnovers, uh, having a little bit of an older group, can that help a little bit in that area? Or what you, yeah, what you see? absolutely. In the, the day, we didn't get enough. And down the stretch, we didn't tackle good enough. And, uh, you know, turnovers are kind of a unique thing. And that's been a huge emphasis of ours 
uh, in the off season. You know, studying people. You know, you had Joe Houston, you had Will, some guys from the National Football League, where they get to spend more time doing football in the off season. Some of the things they brought Chris Couch. You know, they do a big a lot of that stuff for us from a football research standpoint. Um, it's a conscious effort all the time to attack the football, and every play, someone should be doing it. You know what I mean? And in the, the day, that ball is our job. And the urgency that it takes, and the not just that, but the, the the deliberate work to get the ball out. And look, you know, our last year, so I think we had like 25 or 28 turnovers, and we really didn't do anything different. You know, and in the, the day, when you don't have a good result, you got to soul search and you got to figure out how to do it. And I think we've done a really good job with that. And I think so far in practice, you've seen that. Um, and relative the tackling, you know, inconsistency. We didn't tackle very good in the, in the third level of the defense last year. Uh, I think there's some things that I could have done better to keep the ball off of them a little bit. But in this league, they're going to they're make you tackle in, 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 in the secondary. And we've got to do better. And we've got to approach the football. And I think that's some of the value that Will's bought, brought to our team, Coach Roberts. Uh, and it's a mindset, too. You know what I mean? Like everybody tackles. You know, and you're going to play at Florida, you got to tackle. And it wasn't good enough. And I think what we've done so far has been good, but it's, we got to get headed in the right direction with them we're working really hard at. It was amazing to go back and look at last season, how it started and how much better we felt about this defense, especially after the Tennessee game. And while that Tennessee offense wasn't what it was the season before, it was still an okay offense. And this defense showed up completely dominating the first half of that game that helped lead to that upset. And, we thought that it was a building block, only to be shifted the other way. A couple of weeks later, getting blasted by Kentucky, and that was when we really saw the lack of physicality show up that just wouldn't go away the rest of the season. Um, the, the lack of tackling, the lack of shedding blocks, not getting behind the line of scrimmage for sacks or tackles for loss, no turnovers. I mean, it was, it was when we really saw the part where Armstrong mentioned that tackling at the third level really became apparent in a problem in, in a player like Jalen Kimber that was a liability on the field. That also extends to the point why, you know, he made uh, while being young and inexperienced, that wasn't the only issue. When you see experienced players like Kimber, and Jason Marshall, and Miguel Mitchell, Scooby Williams are, are out there missing tackles left and right. Uh, only one of those guys returned and that was Marshall who did improve uh, as the season went on and should hopefully benefit from where strong, where Armstrong went with, Quote, keeping the ball off of them. We saw once once Florida got plowed over by Kentucky last season, the offenses attacked the Florida secondary into forced matchups that you know made them tackle, and, and it wasn't pretty. So better play up front needs to happen, not only to help those guys, but also help keep those situations from the secondary. Now, the secondary needs to step up and, you know, getting better at tackling, and you know, we've seen that in the, in the practice and in the focus so far for practice. We've seen him working with Will Harris and them tackling him and other players with a pad instead of a tackling donut that we've seen so much the past years. It's been a focus early on, and it should be. And this tackling has been an issue for this Florida defense dating back to 2020. A lack of physicality, a lack of presence on that side of the ball. They're, they, they are dictated. They're not doing the dictating. That's been my biggest issue with this defense. And a lot of it's been... You know, you don't have the players, but there's there's been enough players in this little four year stretch of terrible defense where it should not look like it has been, and they continued last year. So hopefully, take all those um, new, the new faces on the staff and a and an obvious approach this spring to make that better. All right, so let's keep it going. All right here on the defense, let's get some thoughts from Austin Armstrong on the young front, the young front group of defensive linemen Kelby Collins and edge players T.J. Searcy and L.J. McCray. So pretty much uh, took all my three minutes I'm allowed to take from Florida right there uh, for, for, for the video portion. So let's just go through what um, he had to say on Kelby Collins right here. He goes, yeah, Kelby, you know, I was talking to a, re a recruit on the field, and you know the way we practice, right? We two-spot, we have multiple drills going on at a time, and the best way to get better, to be a better football player, is playing football. And you know, Kelby is a great example of that. Kelby gets here in January. He's got a unique physical skill set. He's big. He's long. You know, he's an inside player. Is he, is he an inside player? Is he an edge player? In our defense, he can really do both. And that's what really makes him special. The thing I respect about Kelby is he stayed with it. We were able to create a role for him in our sub package last year. Started on third down, really, the whole season. It was a really productive player. 
Obviously, he was a freshman all-conference all player. I think Kelby can be as good as anybody in the conference. His position flex is really impressive. He's tough. I think he's brought a tremendous amount of urgency to that room. Kelby wants to win. And you talk to his family, they want to win, and they're serious. And I respect him so much for the work he puts in. I'm excited to see. I don't want to put any expectations on the guy, but I really think the guy can do something special. That's what Austin Armstrong had to say about Kelby Collins. Let's move on to TJ Searcy. I love TJ. TJ's my kind of guy, South Georgia guy. He's tough. He loves football, you know. Like when he's out there, he plays the game the way it's supposed to be played. It's important to him. He's really smart. Even though he's a quiet guy, he's a conscious note taker. He wants to be the best he can be. And you know the guy played a bunch of good football for us last year as an 18-year-old, as a freshman. And I think he's not just for him, but for everybody. I think he can take some steps relative to playing the run and doing some stuff for us. He played a lot of in-sub package for us last year, but TJ is tough. He's smart, he's hungry, he loves football, and you want to get as many guys like that on the team as possible. I'm glad he's on our team. And let's keep it going with true freshman LJ McCray. Austin Armstrong had to say he walks in, he's six foot six, weighs 270 something pounds. He can run, he can bend, he's really smart, he loves football, he's highly motivated. He wants to be really good. He's humble. He's really everything you want. And I think Coach Peterson had Peterson has done a really good job coaching him. He plays our field defensive end. He's a hybrid guy that can play four-eye technique, can play five technique, can drop, can rush. I mean, I think the sky's the limit for the guy. So look, there's a lot of pass rushing potential here in this young group. Collins was very successful in his limited snaps last year. Uh, not as much at the F spot as last season, well, as we'll see coming up, as, he, as he's been seen working with the defensive line group this season, along with Cam Jackson, Joey Slatman, Caleb Banks. Look, he adds quickness and athleticism in that, to that group that I'm not sure any of those other guys really can provide. Um, as much as I, I like those guys, he's a different type of player up front with those guys. He provides some versatility there. He is certainly the player I see in more pass rush situations uh, get, compared to those other players. So third down, I think he's still going to be a factor, but I think we'll see him play more first, second down. Um, hopefully become more of a three-down player, but there's some good players uh, in that group. Cam Jackson coming back from last year. Joey Slightman as a transfer, all-world. Caleb Banks coming back. I thought he did some nice things there as well. So I think you get more bodies up there. You get more consistency from that group. Uh, but e eager to see Kelby Collins just take that freshman to sophomore jump. And look, seriously provided to be dependable at times. Um, in run defense, accumulating three and a half tackles for a loss, 13 stops, and 26 total tackles. His six tackles for a loss were six on the team. He was the Gators' highest graded tackler, 87.5 with Pro Football Focus, played 258 snaps. But now it's about being more consistent in, in that area. As you heard Armstrong mention, they want him to take steps there in run defense. And I think LJ McCray is just too unique of an athlete to keep off the field. Uh, he has a size and speed combo that hardly anyone else has, not just on Florida's roster, but in the country. I mean, there's a reason he was one of the top defenders this past recruiting class. Playing that F spot for the Gators, so someone that needs to use all of that speed, all of that size on the field, on, on that field side. You heard Armstrong mention that he can do it all. He can shift closer to inside as well, rush, drop. This is the type of player. Um, that to me, it'd be too hard to keep off the field as long as he comes along. As long as he does what, does what he's supposed to do, I think we'll see a lot of LJ McCray, even as a true freshman, just given the body type he is, size, speed, combo, he's just going to be way too hard to keep off the field. All right, so let's keep it going with um, Austin Armstrong identifying some players here, and this one will be Jason Marshall. We'll hear from him in just a second, but... Jason was probably as good of a Christmas gift that I got. You know what I mean, says Austin Armstrong? Working through that process of the climate in college football, the opportunity to play in a National Football League, and Jason is a first-class person. He's got a great family. I think the things that the University of Florida is about, I think the things that Coach Napier is about, that he and his family are about, the degree, the human experience here, the value this place adds to your life. And it just so happens Jason's a really good football player, too. I can't put in the words to describe the job that Will has done with Jason, talking about new coach Will Harris, the urgency that he's brought out of him. 
You know, the last practice before we got on spring break, he made a huge play and punched the ball out. I think Jason could be as good as he wants to be. I mean, that was really good to hear, uh, and especially that um, play at, right before spring break. You know, play toward the end of spring uh, of a practice, and he's creating a turnover. We just talked about the lack of turnovers this Florida defense had last year, and that's the point of emphasis too. Tackles, turnovers, sacks, all the havoc plays for this Florida defense need to be in focus this spring. And hopefully, that's just a precursor here. Jason Marshall, create the turnover, get the ball out. Hopefully, we see some things about that, more things like that coming up in the fall. But here we go. Let's hear from Jason Marshall on his return and more. I just feel like it was the best decision for me and then my family and then also the team, uh, you know, to come back. Uh, felt like I left a lot on the field. And then also, you know, to come back and get my degree, you know, that was the biggest thing for, like I said, myself and my family. Um, and then just to mention my team again, you know, I, one last ride with them, so. Austin said it was like an early Christmas present for him, you coming back. Mm -hmm. and, and what do you hope to accomplish this year and, and bring to this defense? Because I know last year for you guys, uh, it had to be very frustrating. Um, like you said, you know, it was very frust frustrating, but, um, you know, me coming back, just taking on that leader role. You know, I have a, a lot of young guys in the room now, so I have to, you know, up my standards while upping their standards as well. So You were a five-star guy. A lot of people thought you wouldn't be here for this year. What is, uh, what's kind of the mission for you? Now that you're, you already kind of talked about it a little bit, but given that, given the expectations, what, what's kind of your mindset on, on, on that part? Um, you know, just fixing the things that I left on the field. Uh, it was a lot of things that I left on the field that I could have done better. Um, so working on that, like technique-wise, uh, could have did that much better last year. So just coming in this year with a fresh mindset and working on the things that I need to work on. Along with the NFL, I'm sure you probably had some suitors in the transfer portal. When you decided to come back at school, did you even entertain going somewhere else? And if not, why? No, I didn't. I was here, 100% here. Okay. Um, you know, just the culture here, and I started here. Why not finish here? Will Harris, what do you like about him? Sorry, Kevin. Yes. Uh, great guy, great guy. Um, you know, I got a good first impression. Um, came in with a lot of energy. Uh, you know, ready to coach us, and you know, and I'm excited for what he's gonna do in the season. How's he trying to make you better? In a lot of ways, you know, him coming from the league. Uh, you know, he have a lot of experience, um, and that's where I'm trying to go. So, you know, he just coaching me and giving me the steps on what I got to do. What's the biggest thing he's harping on with you? Uh, you know, technique. Um, that's pretty much the biggest that's thing, sure. you know, and effort, stuff like that. Three interceptions last year, I think, which I was hard to believe when I saw that. But, but what it, I mean, do you take that personally? I don't want to say personally, but you guys see that and are like, how do you improve on that? Does it fire you guys up? Do you watch more films? What it, what's it going to take to kind of improve on that number? Or is it just kind of an arbitrary thing that sometimes they come your way and sometimes they don't? One, it starts with watching film, um, you know, knowing what the offense is going to do. And then two, you know, being a ball hawk, going up and getting the ball, you know. Like uh, Coach Harris tell us, if the ball is in the air, it's ours and nobody's. So. Ours and nobody's. Man. That mindset's needed <laughs> there on the back end. Hopefully create some more turnovers. But look, for Jason Marshall, just a player that needs to put it together. Look, Florida just had their pro day last week, and Jason Marshall was someone that was expected to take part in pro day in preparation for the you know, NFL draft coming up. A year ago, we would have put Jason Marshall on the list to be in Florida's pro day. Um, Florida was never going to have a crazy number of picks this year, but if we go back to a year ago, Last season was supposed to be a season to take off for Jason Marshall. Uh, another season with Corey Raymond, and it just never came along. He did get better as the season went on. He played almost 2,000 snaps, and it needs to pay off. I mean, he's played 2,000 snaps in his career. That's a lot of snaps. You heard Billy Napier talk about that earlier this episode. All the snaps are coming back. Needs to pay off for Jason Marshall. Needs to pay off for the team. You know, Marshall did achieve a, a single-season career high with 10 pass breakups last year. His allowed completion percentage and coverage dropped significantly from the previous season uh, from an 
from 56.3% to an impressive 44.7 over 48 targets. So improvement there as far as completion percentage against him went. But however, according to Pro Football Focus, Marshall allowed 421 yards to the receivers he defended. And that's the most he surrendered in a single year to date. So receivers averaged 24.2 yards a catch against Jason Marshall. So part of the big plays that were given up last year as well for, for this Florida defense. So certainly you know, not as many catches on Jason Marshall last year, but they went for more yards. So that's the, the improvement there. That was just something systemic in this defense last year. So when it's all said and done, yeah, this is the year, if it's ever going to happen at Florida, there's a new approach with Will Harris, Ron Roberts coming in as well. This is the year Marshall needs to become that top defensive back that we thought he'd be. It's time. And this is the quote-unquote money year. I don't see a, a situation, kind of like a princely situation, where you know, we thought he'd be going into the draft this year as well, but he ends up transferring somewhere else. I, I don't necessarily see that for Jason Moore. I think this is the do-or-die year for him, whether it be at Florida, him transferring somewhere else a year from now, I don't think would do much for him. I think there's enough out there on Jason Marshall, enough snaps on there on Jason Marshall. And if we're going to see the jump, we need to we need to see it here at Florida this year. And I think he needs to to do it. I'm not sure it ever happens. I hope for his sake, I hope it does. There's a lot of pressure on him and back there being the guy. Um uh, pair that with Devin Moore. Pair that with some of the young guys, Jakeem Jackson. I mean they need they all need to take a step as uh, as a group. Devin Moore staying healthy. Dejon Johnson, Jakeem Jackson, need to be guys that follow along behind Jason Marshall. Let him be the leader of that group. But first, I think leader needs to be go prove on the field that you can be that guy. So there we go. Get you caught up through spring ball a little bit. Nice to hear from Napier, Armstrong, Jason Marshall there. A little more insider practice notes. Good stuff there. Get you caught up on spring football the last few days. So let's move forward. Let's go into a little bit of recruiting news. And we thought, look, I thought um, maybe we'd be rolling the we got a commit graphic right here based off of something that happened Saturday night, but it didn't last long. It looked like on late Saturday night that Florida had found their next commitment for the class of 2025. It was announced by Eric Fawcett of On3 that safety from Lakeland, Keon Young, had committed to Florida and it looks like that actually did happen. But sources say the staff is not planning on taking his commitment at the moment. Staff is still evaluating Young, but there was a lack of communication somewhere. Somewhere here. And on the surface, it's not a great look, you know, from the Florida side for the Lakeland safety. Um, but look, uh, just miscommunication that just shouldn't happen for a recruit and a football player a high school football player. Now, look, a source I trust has shared some info in the Gators Breakdown Plus Discord, says the relationship is salvageable, uh, and quote, that this will work out in the end. It has to. Kid is a good player. We need two to three safeties in the class anyway, end the quote. So you, you hope this doesn't hurt Florida in the Lakeland area if this ends going if this ends up going the wrong way. Young's a top 250-ish player overall. I uh, was, you know, thought to be a heavy Florida lean the last few months, and and the commitment just seemed imminent anyway. Uh, Will Harris has treated Young as a top priority and even almost committed to Florida back in January after spending time with Coach Napier. You know, telling Gators online, Corey Bender, quote, he was asking me questions about how I like the program, how much I like the program because he wants me, Young said. He thinks I can be a playmaker at his school. So a former USF commit, Young has additional offers from Oregon, Auburn, Oklahoma, Texas A&M, Tennessee, Miami, Kentucky, USC, South Carolina, among others. And look, if we zoom out a little bit, could all this have to do with Florida having good feelings on other safety prospects? Florida still seems to be the runaway favorite for Jacksonville's Mandarin Hilton Stubbs, a top 100 player, one of the top safeties in the country. He's coming, you know, he's coming off a visit to Auburn that went really well for the Tigers this past weekend. So um, hopefully that one still feels good. I still feel good there. The Gators are also in the top three for safety. Bryce Fitzgerald out of Miami Columbus, top 225-ish player 
put Florida along with USC and Miami in his top three. He has an official visit set for Florida June 14th, but he will make his decision before that on May 24th, his mom's birthday. So next couple months, we'll probably get some clarity there. Uh, Stubbs just kind of seems to be on commit watch at any moment now, but may take his time. But May 24th may be the next time we hear from the safety spot, Bryce Fitzgerald. So weird situation overall with Young committing, but staff still evaluating. Other great options out there. Certainly some miscommunication in this whole ordeal. And look, I feel I feel for Young, you know, to be in this situation. Hopefully it all gets resolved soon. Look, could he perhaps be the third safety in the 25 class? The Florida only want two. Are there others Florida still deciding from as well? We'll see how it all shakes out. But odd story, miscommunication there somewhere along the way. Uh, but hopefully it all gets resolved. All right, so let's keep it going. Final topic here I'm going to hit on. wanted to hit on it late last week, but as I said, some weird, weird life happenings last week. But let's get into the SEC announcing the 2025 SEC schedule. And boy, did they drop the ball. Really dropped the ball to the SEC here. Gators 2025 SEC opponents were revealed as the SEC announced that the scheduling format for the 2025 football season was announced last Wednesday. Similar to the 2024 SEC football schedule, during the 2025 season, teams will play eight conference games plus one required opponent from the ACC, Big Ten, Big 12, Pac-12, or major independent. The only thing that's really changing are the out-of-conference games. School will, schools will play the same opponents in 2025 that they are scheduled to play in 2024. With sites change for equal home and away competition over the course of two seasons. So we'll pull it up for Florida. That means the game in Jacksonville versus Georgia. Then you get the home games of now Texas, Mississippi State, and Tennessee in the conference. FSU, USF, FAMU at home as well. Go to away games in 2025. LSU, Texas A&M, Ole Miss, and Kentucky. All those are home games this year for Florida. There'll be away games in 2025. Miami is on the road at a conference as well. But this was this was lazy by the SEC. I don't I don't knock much of what Greg Sankey does and what the SEC offices do, but they dropped the ball here. This is absolutely lazy to give us the same opponents 24 and 25. If this was the case, it should have just given us the 1-7 schedule format for this season and next. One permanent, and then seven opponents this season, and the other seven next season. It would have given us to play all the SEC teams with Texas and Oklahoma joining in a two-year span. That makes so much more sense than giving us this bullcrap schedule and the same opponents two years in a row. When there was a, there was a chance, this is a two-year stopgap. 24 and 25 are going to be unique, or they were supposed to be unique. The SEC dropped the ball on that. But 26 is a clean slate. They're, they're starting something new in 2026. 24 and 25 would have been some great experimentation. And the only experimentation they wanted to do was give us the same opponents. Two-year stopgap until something more formal in 2026, but the SEC just it really dropped the ball here. And for me, this is not about the potential of how hard Florida's schedule could be. That is not my angle here. I wanted a variety. I saw that's what I wanted. I wanted something exciting. I wanted variety to the schedule. And as my good friend Nick De La Torre pointed out on Twitter, quote, since 2012, Florida has played Texas A&M four times and traveled to College Station three times. That number will reach five in 24 and six in 2025, with four to six games in College Station. Georgia has played A&M one time since the Aggies joining the SEC in 2012 and has never been to College Station. So the schedule has had little variety, and this was something to do. This was a chance to do something different, but the SEC dropped the ball here. This could have been an opportunity for Florida to play Oklahoma. Auburn and get back to playing a South Carolina, Missouri, or Vanderbilt after not playing them in 2024. I'm just not a fan of how, how this come about at all. 
And I know most people aren't from the responses I've seen. This is, to me, it's such lazy move from the SEC. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm excited to see Texas come to the swamp, Florida, Georgia, FSU in the swamp in 25 again. But there could have been more. And who knows what the SEC even looks like in 2026 when the next round of expansion likely. And the SEC dropped the ball by not letting the current format with Texas and Oklahoma go through a phase where all the teams would have played each other in a two-year window. Because the expansion is not done, guys. And don't be surprised if FSU or Clemson or other schools out there are in the SEC by 2026. And the chance you would have had to play everybody in 24-25 just goes away. And now we're just going to have to go through some funky rotation starting in 2026 before you play everybody in a three, four-year window instead of back-to-back window like we could have had here. Now, if the SEC stays the same, we'll probably get that in 26, but I doubt it stays the same. I doubt it stays at 16 teams. Now, in looking at this, if we're going to just take a look at the teams and get away from the failure the SEC had, and looking at the schedule, Florida could catch many of these teams working in new quarterbacks in 2025. Georgia will more than likely be replacing Carson Beck. Texas and Kieran Ewers, this would be his last year at Texas. FSU will need to replace DJ Uyongale. Garrett Nussmeyer could be one and done starter at LSU. Connor Wegman at Texas A&M could leave after a good season. Ole Miss will lose Jackson Dart. Miami will only have Cam Ward for this season. So while the teams, those are named teams, the teams are tough overall, there will be some quarterback questions with these teams in the 2025 season. So as I said, this mostly for me was had nothing to do with the difficulty or the possible difficulty of this schedule. It just, it just wasn't. That has nothing really to do. I just wanted some variety. I wanted to play Oklahoma. I want to play Auburn again. We had a chance for maybe somewhat of an easier game down there, too. But as I said, that wasn't necessarily. If you look at you know South Carolina, Vanderbilt, maybe Missouri. Missouri's on, on the uprise. I don't want to call them an easy win or anything, but still. You know, this was a chance to give us some variety, something unique in 24-25. Instead, we get the same opponents two years in a row. Makes no sense to me. Lazy approach. But all right, that would do it right here for this episode of Gators Breakdown. As I mentioned, there was a lot to get into. Everybody, thanks for hopping on right here, given the circumstances for me. Thanks for, as I said, for all the well wishes and stuff the last couple of days. But that will do it right here for this episode of Gators Breakdown. I'm your host, David Waters. You can find me on social media at GatorDave underscore SEC. Guys and girls out there, thank you for joining me on this episode of Gators Breakdown.